hey, today I, wanna, I, I want us to kind of go a little bit back to the basics, and, and then I want us to kind of look forward to the future a little bit. When Claire and I moved uh, to Reno about 13 years ago to get ready to start Life Church about 12 and a half years ago, we, we really ha- had a real idea of the kind of church that we felt called to start, and, and it really, it really, the idea really doesn't start with us. It's really right from the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, we see a picture of the very first church, and so a couple times a year at Life Church, we go back and look at that passage and just you know, in a sense kind of looking at the mirror saying are, are we becoming the church that God's called us to be so if you have your Bibles go over to Acts chapter 2 yeah. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 a little bit of context here so what's happened is it's not been very long since uh, since Jesus has died on the cross it's not been very long since he's ascended into heaven and, and what has happened right before in this passage is what's called the day of Pentecost. There were all these people gathered together. The Holy Spirit shows up in a powerful way. And, and, the end of, uh, and in verse 41, it says about 3,000 people came to faith that day and were baptized. There were these brand new Christians. And, and so the church has grown rapidly in this moment. And then beginning in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see a snapshot of what this very first church looked like what they were all about and so for us at life church we come back to this passage a couple times a year and look at this very first church and and, and say this is the kind of church that we're praying that god would form us into and so in acts chapter 2 and verse 42 it says and they these brand new christians they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So, so part of what this early church was doing is they were getting together and the apostles were teaching them. They were people that really wanted to, to learn about God. They, they, were, they, they, they were learning about God, and it says in the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. When the Bible here talks about the breaking of bread, it's literally talking about taking communion. We just did it a few moments ago. They, they would take some bread and take some wine and just remember what Jesus had done. Really what we see here is that this early church was very very much centered on Jesus. They'd get together and they say, hey, it was just a few months ago that, that, that Jesus said, hey, remember what I'm about to do. I'm about to die on the cross for your sins. I, I, I'm about to shed my blood for your sins. And so this bread, it's a picture of my body. This wine, it's a picture of my blood. They'd say, let's remember what Jesus did. He died in our place. He rose from the dead. This early church, it was very much centered on Jesus. What we see here in these first couple of verses is that this that this very this early church it was really all about loving God. And, and so at Life Church we say one of our first big thing that we're about is we're a, a bunch of people that are really in love with God and we see that here in these first couple of verses here in verse 42 and 43 it says they were breaking bread they were remembering what Jesus did and they were praying. It was a praying church it was people these they, they just had their lives changed they, they'd just gone from death to life they'd just gone from darkness to light they'd had their sins forgiven they'd been adopted as children of God and so now they recognize that now they had this direct access to the father they had this relationship with the father and they were going to take advantage of it they were going to talk to God at this early church they were a praying church and then we see what happens when God's people pray we see here verse 43 it says, and awe. That word awe is for the Greek, from the Greek root phobos, where we get our word phobia. It's really this idea of a holy fear, not like a scared kind of fear, but that kind of sense of wonder where you just kind of recognize something's different here. There's something different about these people and this place and what's happening. And that's what was happening here with these early Christians is they just had this tangible sense of the presence of God. There was this holy awe that was taking place there's a sense of God's presence and then there was a sense of God's power it says and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and so this early church they were praying but it wasn't just kind of an obligatory prayer it wasn't just checking a box praying for your food they were praying with an expectation that the God of the universe was going to show up in power and answer their prayers and that's what was happening they were seeing the lame walk they were seeing the blind were beginning to see they were seeing these miracles happen there was this sense of God's presence and this sense of God's power and we just see this snapshot of this very 
early church is that, that, that they were very much in love with God. They were learning about him. They were remembering what Jesus did. They were centered on Jesus. They were praying. They were experiencing his presence. They were experiencing his power. In preparation for this week's message, I thought to myself, you know what, these, some of these people, some of you in here this, this first service have heard me talk about this stuff for like 12 or 13 years. And, and so I thought, you know what, instead of it just being me talk about the kind of church that Life Church ought to be, the church that we desire God to form us into, I sent a quick text to just a handful of people that I just had their number already in my phone. And I said, hey, when you think about Life Church, what do you think? I want to share with you a few quotes, specifically about this thing about God and, and, and just centering our lives on him. Let's look at that first one. Uh, some of these, some of these. I said, "Hey, if you if you've got uh, children or teenagers, feel free to have them send something to." Here's Brianna Sump, one of our 14 year olds, freshman in high school. She says, "I love our church because I'm getting so much out of the youth group. Jericho is so challenging. It really encourages me knowing God better. Isn't that good? 14 year old kid. Let's see another one. Matthias Garzon, age nine." He says, uh, life starts in a place where I can learn about the only true God that loves us. What nine-year-old talks like that? <laughs> I can learn about the one true God and his son, Jesus. Um, uh, a place where I can learn, <laughs> if you knew his dad, who literally is a rocket scientist, you'd understand. Um, a place where I can learn about the only true God that loves us. And, just make sure we know he's a real kid. Because we have fun leaders and learn about God with funny examples. Learning about God is more fun with funny examples. Let's see another one. Sean Gorn, a great guy at our church. Life Church means family to us. This family encourages us, challenges us to go deeper, to act on what we believe. We're proud to bring anyone to Life Church where they can find Jesus and be supported. Let me show you one more right here. Carl Baker. It says, uh, Life Church means the beginning to me, the beginning of my relationship with Christ. It is the vehicle that God used to get me into a relationship with him. My wife wanted me to go to church, and I never connected with the church until we attended Life Church. And, and so you see here this, this first church, this early church, the, the first and foremost, they were a group of people really in love with God. They were learning about him. They were praying to him. They were remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection. They were experiencing his presence. They were seeing his power in action. And so at Life Church, when we say we want to be a church that loves God, that's what we're talking about. We want to be that kind of church you see in Acts 2, 42 and 43. Let me show you verse 44. It says, and all who believed were together. There was this great unity in this early church, and they had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. See, what had happened here is, is that there was, there was these thousands of people that had gathered together um, for this Jewish holiday called the Day of Pentecost, and it was on that day that the Holy Spirit showed up in power. These 3,000 brand new Christians come to faith, and so their life, their life had been changed. And so they said, man, I want to be here around what God's doing here and now. I can't imagine going back to where I'm from, where my house is, and where my job is, because something special is happening right here and right now. So I'm going to hang out here for a while. And so essentially what you happened is you had a couple thousand refugees, so to speak. People that, 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 that were kind of displaced, didn't know where to go, didn't have a job, didn't have an income, didn't have a house. And so these brand new Christians recognized that God had made them family. And so they said, hey, you can stay with us. If you're going to be here the next few months or however long it takes you to find a place here, get a job here, you can stay with us and we'll make sure you got food to eat. And then people that had more started selling and sharing with people that had less. What this Hurley church did is they really loved each other. And so a life church, we want to be a church that really loves God. We want to be a church that really loves each other, that recognizes that Jesus didn't just die so we could have our sins forgiven, that he didn't just die so that we could go to heaven when we die, that he didn't just die so that we could have the Holy Spirit live inside of us, that he also died to make us a part of his family. And so we're in this thing together in this early church, they understood that. They had this incredible unity. They were sharing their stuff, and then they were also sharing their lives. Let me show this to you. So not only did they, did they make sure that nobody had any need but by, by sharing, it says verse 46. It says, and day by day. 
attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Here's what it's saying here. Man, these early Christians, man, they just loved to be together. Man, they, they so loved each other that they would, they would get together. And, and, and so they'd get together on a Sunday in a large group in the temple courts. They'd get together on a Sunday and they would, they'd sing Jesus songs. And, and they'd take communion and they'd be taught the, the word of God. And, and they'd just have this great time together. And they'd say, man, I can't imagine waiting a whole nother week to do this. How about some of us get together tomorrow night at your house? And, and let's eat some food and let's talk about Jesus and let's just be together. Let's pray for each other. And, and see, throughout the New Testament, we see all these instructions of what our relationships with each other inside God's family are supposed to look like. A lot of them end in the phrase, one another. It's like encourage one another and serve one another and forgive one another and honor one another and, and all these different. And so those things happen best in small groups. And so what it's saying here is they'd get together in the temple courts, but then they'd say, man, I can't imagine waiting a whole other week to do this. Let's get together tomorrow night at your house. They'd get together Monday night at someone else's house. They'd talk about Jesus, eat some food, have a great time together. And then they'd say, hey, let's do this again tomorrow night. And so they were literally getting together every day just because they loved to be together so very much. They were sharing their stuff. They were sharing their lives because they recognized that they really were family. As I sent out that text and people sent me back just little thoughts about what Life Church means to them, this theme came over and over again. Let me share with you some of these. Andrea McVaney, she sent a really, really, really long quote. And so this is the first half. I'll give you the rest, other half later. It says, Life Church means to me that this community of Christians is also our soccer community, our drop-in and hang-out community, our support community. It's cliche, but it's true. We do life with our Life Church family. See another one. Alan Sump said, Life Church has been so great. It's truly like extended family. We eat together, we care for each other, and grow closer as we minister as a team. See another one. Dusty Braun, one of our elders, said, Life Church means to me a place where the gospel is preached, people are loved, and a community is reached. I love our church because of the sense of community. I actually feel like I'm, quote, doing life with others, which isn't always present in church. See another one. Nancy Linton goes to our Midtown campus and said, we love Life Church because we do life with friends that have become like family. I'm telling you, I, I didn't tell these people what to say. I didn't give them a script. I said, when you think about Life Church, what do you think? And over and over and over again, this thing of family just kept coming back, this thing of doing life. That's why we always make such a big deal about life groups. In a couple of weeks, you'll have a chance to sign up for our fall life groups. And it's just people that kind of get together, you, most of them on a weekly basis, some in the morning, some at night, some that are couples, some that are singles, some that are for men, some that are for ladies, and just get together. And you, most of them eat some food and talk about what Jesus is doing in their life, pray for one another, but really just form these great Christ-centered relationships. It's this family thing. And so this early church, man, it was all about loving God, and it was all about loving each other, and then it was all about making a difference. Let me show you here, verse 46. It says, they ate their food, glad and generous hearts, verse 47, praising God, they were worshiping church. Jesus had changed their life. Their natural response was to worship him. But they were having favor with all the people. See, as, as, as the people around saw that these people, that there was something different about them. The way in which they, they, they lived their lives, the, the way in which they, they were employees, the way in which they were neighbors, the way in which they were friends, the way in which they were family members, they saw something different in them. The, the way the life of Jesus was flowing through them, that they were living like Jesus. They were loving like Jesus. They were serving like Jesus. They were caring for the poor like Jesus. They were caring for the sick like Jesus. And so people looked and they said, man, there's something different about them. That The way that, that there was no class distinction. The way in which for the first time in human history, rich and poor came together and called one another brother and sister. They saw that there was something different. The, the way there were no needy among them. The way in which they were absolutely people that before ha had been one way, and now there was something different about them. They, people around were curious. People around were saying, man, there's something different about those guys. They were enjoying this favor. 
And then they were making a difference. Let me show you here, verse uh, 47. It says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Man, people said, man, if God can do that for you, maybe he can do that for me. People would look at someone they'd known a long time who their whole life had been kind of an angry jerk, but now he's just become kind and gracious and compassionate. And they'd say, what happened to you? And then the other person would say, man, let me tell you, man, there was this guy, Jesus, and he changed my life, and he can change yours. And, and they're thinking, man, if he can do that for you, what can he do for me? Someone whose whole, whole, whole life had been centered on hoarding and greed and how much can I gather now becomes absolutely generous, selling what they have to help the needy. And someone says, man, I've always known you to be a miser and to just love your stuff, but now you're like the most generous person I know. What happened to you? And then the people say, let me tell you, his name is Jesus. And so so the Bible here says literally every single day more and more people were coming to faith. And so at Life Church, we've always said, man, we want to be a church madly in love with Jesus. A church that really loves each other and a church that makes a big difference locally and globally. Let me share with you what some people from Life Church said about this. Mike Bosma, great guy at Life Church, says, when I was at my lowest low, when most of my quote friends had shunned me, the people at Life Church embraced and supported me, helped me pick up the pieces of my very broken life. I am forever blessed. That's what Life Church means to me. Let's see another one. Matt Platshorn said, Life Church means home, a shelter during the worst life can throw at me. Let's see another one. Andrew McVaney, the rest of her super long quote. Here it is. I love our church because God's spirit is alive and moving through the people who make up Life Church. Hearts and lives are changing in our city because of life churchers. When you say life churcher, it sounds borderline cultish, so don't. And so uh, answering God's call to live as Jesus would in our homes, neighborhoods, workplaces, etc. One last one. Julia App said, life church is a community of people that have come together to give selflessly, work eagerly, and serve diligently. It's a pleasure to be a part of eternal work. So Life Church, who, 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 are, who are we called to be? Man, we're called to, just like this early church, man, was centered on, man, just being in love with Jesus because he changed their life, really loving one another because he made them family, and then really making a difference with our lives because Jesus has left us with some work to do. And, and so uh, part of that at Life Church over these last two years ha has been what's called the Elevate Initiative. That, that two years ago, in, in December of 2016, the people of Life Church kind of began this, what we, we're, we call kind of a two-year spiritual journey, where, where those of us that call Life Church our church, really kind of pressing into God, asking Him to do something fresh in our lives, taking us to a new place of love for Him, a new place of passion for His kingdom, and a new place of faith, where we'd care more and more about forever stuff, and less and less about temporary stuff, and that the overflow of this would be just kind of this radical generosity that would funnel that would fuel the mission that God's called us to over this two year period check out this video in December of 2016 the people of Life Church began a two year journey of faith and radical generosity called Elevate committing nearly 8.7 million dollars in pledges and expected gifts the last 20 months have been amazing. So far, we've received nearly $6 million. We are so grateful to God and amazed by the incredible generosity of so many. In addition to resourcing the ongoing ministry and missions budgets of the church, God is using Life Church in many more incredible ways. In January of 2017, we were able to fully fund the construction of a church building in Bolivia that houses a Compassion International project and ensures that over 200 children, most of whom are sponsored monthly by the people of Life Church, receive nutrition, education, health care, and learn about Jesus. Earlier this year, a team from Life Church was able to attend the grand opening ceremony and serve the people in Bolivia. In May of 2017, we were able to open our South Campus Kids Building where we currently hold our weekend services. And soon after, we opened our Monday through Friday preschool, Kids Life Child Development Center, where nearly 200 children receive an excellent Christ-centered preschool education. In May of this year, we were able to celebrate the official grand opening of the Midtown Campus of Life Church. 
In just a few short months, a truly remarkable community is already forming, with new people joining every week, connecting to God and each other. At the end of the day, everything about the Elevate Initiative is with the goal of people encountering the love of Jesus. In the last 19 months, through the ministry of Life Church, over 170 people have made decisions to follow Christ and be baptized. We're very grateful for all that has already happened through the Elevate Initiative, and today, we're excited to share some next steps on our Elevate journey. Hey, so uh, isn't, that, isn't that some great stuff there? Isn't that really good? Hey, so I just want to take a few minutes and share with you a couple of exciting next steps uh, related to our Elevate initiative. And so... Um, in, in case you're just kind of new to the whole Elevate thing. So the Elevate Initiative, um, the generosity of, of, of the Elevate Initiative through kind of December 2016, through December 2018. Through, so kind of a two-year initiative. We've got about four months left. And, and what that does is it is meeting the ongoing general fund operational needs of the church. It's allowing us to make a bigger difference outside of South Reno than we ever have before. And it's uh, including launching our Midtown campus. And it's allowing us to take next steps on uh, the construction of the next phase of our South Campus. A and so right now we're meeting in a room that was designed to be a dodgeball room for our elementary age kids. And so it's kind of, that's why you got like these, uh, some, um, you see these kind of uh, cages around the lights. It's so kids can throw lights, uh, throw, not throw lights, that'll be terrible. <laughs> throw balls in this room and not have to worry about breaking stuff. That's the ultimate purpose of this room. And so right now we meet in here where we can cram on a good day about 210 seats. And our, our second service last week, every seat in here was taken and every seat and the overflow was taken third service you're going into the overflow and so we're looking forward to going to take next steps on our campus and so I shared with you if you were around uh, about a year ago that uh, that due to rising construction costs that if, if we were going to be in a position to take the the full next step and, and build what is planned in, in our phase two which is our gymatorium uh, which uh, upon its build out will seat about 1,200 people, our offices and our foyer, that for us to, to do all that, that, that really through the Elevate Initiative, we would really need to receive closer to $9.5 million. Now, we knew that, that, that the Elevate goal initially was, was, a, was a bold goal before it got increased to the $9.5 million. And, and so, so, you know, we recognize that. So, so far, there's been about $8.7 million in commitments and expected gifts. Now, that includes, there are some people that have let us know that uh, there's one guy in particular who made a, a, a very significant commitment whose whole life has just kind of changed, and, and, and he's an incredible financial challenge, and so he let us know. He said, hey, man, I, when I made that commitment, I really thought I could do it, but some things have changed. We're like, hey, we totally get that. Other people have moved away, other people that, uh, and so right now, um, you know, that, that's that 8.7 million number, um, barring just an incredible end of the year and some other folks kind of stepping up and engaging the Elevate journey, even that number looks uh, um, ambitious. And so let me share with you. So our, our leadership team has been over these last few months wrestling with what is the right next step for us? A next step that allows us to meet the immediate needs of the church so we're no longer meeting in a dodgeball room, a next step that's financially responsible, and a next step that allows us to continue to have, have, um, expand our influence here in South Reno. Here's the thing, guys. Th building these buildings um, may be the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. And uh, short of just, you know, being the amazing husband I am for Claire. And so... Uh, <laughs> Um, that's actually qu quite a bit easier. Um, and so, uh, but here's the thing, for us, man, this honestly is a holy obligation. That, that right, I've shared with some of you, you before, that in this southeast corridor of, of Reno, there, there's only a handful of evangelical churches. A and then, and we would be by far the largest one. And then, and then once you go uh, from South Meadows Parkway, and you'd go south all the way to Geiger Grade, where they're building these houses as fast as they can. 
we are the only evangelical church with plans for a campus. Everyone else is in kind of a strip mall situation, something that's going to limit growth, kind of a, a temporary-ish kind of a, a, a feel at some level. And, and so we look at this kind of southeast corridor where God's placed us, where more people are moving in as fast as they can. And we believe that, that having this campus here, right next to this giant high school, right in the middle of this neighborhood, we take it at some level as having a holy obligation. And that I don't, if we don't do it, I don't see anyone else lining up to do it. And, and so, so this is a big thing for us. Let me share with you kind of what these next steps are going to look like. So if you look at this, never trust me with a laser pointer. I get out of hand. And this one actually has a setting. You can turn it into like disco lights. And so I will sell this after fourth service tonight. And so, uh, so this is our current kids building where we are. Um, and so this is kind of in, in a world where, where construction prices hadn't gone up and where we had all the resources that, that, that we wish we had, we would be building this large foyer um, for fellowship. We would be, uh, this would kind of be the office wing. This is storage back here. This is a kitchen. This is a prayer room. Um, this is a, kind of a little backstage kind of area. And so um, at this moment, our leadership is, is, is fairly sure. We're still kind of dotting our I's, crossing our T's, but, but we're fairly sure that the right next step for us in this moment is this. So this is the core of what I would call the, uh, the gymatorium that ultimately seats about 1,200 people once you have the mezzanine and, and uh, all the seats are, are, are fully maximized. Seats 1,200 when you kind of come in and kind of go into this area that we have taken over temporarily as a temporary foyer. And so this would take out a couple hundred seats. And so, uh, and that we would use this as foyer until we come at a later point and build the rest of the foyer um, around it. And so this would kind of be temporary foyer that one day would have expanded seats in there. So this is kind of the core of that gymatorium. And so at, at what we feel at this moment, and as I said, we're still um, firming this up, dotting our I's, crossing our T's, but fairly certain that building this core of this gymatorium where, where we've got kind of a, a very large meeting space that once it's all kind of finished out, once we add the mezzanine and all that, we'll seat the full 1,200. And, uh, and then we, will, we may or may not build this stage at this point. Some of that will be dependent on how we end the year uh, financially. And also that mezzanine that adds a few hundred kind of upper seats also um, will be dependent on how we, how we end the year. And so, but this allows us to take a meaningful next step going from a room that seats about two, 210, and that's if you really like the people you're sitting by, um, to a room that will immediately seat about seven or 800 and will be able to be expanded once we uh, take out that small temporary foyer, once we add the mezzanine to seat the full 1,200, giving us a great worship space for years to come. And then as God provides and, and, and uh, we have the need, we'll come back and kind of build out the rest of that phase that foyer and office and additional storage, et cetera. And, and so a question I get all the time, when are we going to break ground? And so uh, um, it's a question I ask all the time, when are we going to break ground? And, and so here's the, here it is. Um, if, if things go perfectly, it's my experience in construction is that never happens. Um, but if things go perfectly, it could be as, as soon as early November. Um, it could be as late as, as early spring. Sometime, and so it's just going to depend on, on kind of how fast we kind of get all these ducks in a row. I would, it would be incredible to me if we could begin um, the dirt work and the site improvements in early November. And so that's kind of, that is what we know now. Um, and our, our leadership believes that this is a next step that's financially responsible, allows the church to grow far larger than it is, gets us out of this dodgeball room, which then creates more kids space, gets us out of this overflow room over here, which gets us more kids space and allows us to take a giant next step and still be uh, financially responsible, but allowing us to make a bigger difference than ever before here in South Reno. So that's one thing I want to share. Here's the second thing. Another piece of the Elevate Initiative is, uh, is our giving uh, the, the Life for Reno grant, $100,000 that we're giving to local ministries and nonprofits. And so uh, we've had a team of people, Gary Turner has given some leadership to that team that, that's met over the last few months. We've got a ton of applications. We've got like tons and tons and tons of applications. If you put out a thing saying we're giving away free money, it's amazing how many people show up. And so... Uh, 
and man, so many great causes, great ministries, great organizations making a big difference um, in our city. And today we're awarding the first one of these Life for We Know grants. We'll be giving away a handful more between now and the end of the year. This is the first one, and this is the largest one. Um, check out this video. There's approximately 50,000 people that live out here in the 89506 and 89508. These little communities that starts at Panther Valley, Golden Valley, Lemon Valley, Antelope Valley, Red Rock, Stead, Cold Springs, and Raleigh Heights. We feel that God's put this building in a geographic location so the body can minister to the community. We were here on a Monday night in February, and we were leaving, it was about eight o'clock at night, and we had had some flurries and, and some rain, uh, but as we left uh, the building, we would have never thought that the next morning by 10 a.m. that eight inches of water would be in the church and that the building would be surrounded by water. As uh, the water sat for a couple of months and it was dried out and then it reflooded, uh, so the black mold was an issue. It was suggested that we actually physically raise the building uh, at least 24 inches and put a barrier, a uh, stem wall, and then set it back down. Well, we were able to raise about half of the money that we needed for the project, and so the uh, grant from Life Church will give us that last segment of money that will help us to get to the finish line and to get us to the grand reopening of New Life. Uh, I'd like to say that we're so thankful that a, a fellow body of believers has uh, seen that we are a good cause to invest in. Uh, we're just so thankful for uh, the big heart that Life Church has and that they considered us as one of the ministries to uh, release the grant to. We are so uh, very appreciative. Isn't that, isn't, yeah. <laughs> We've got a couple of the pastors from New Life Assembly God here. Pastor Bob, Pastor Scott, would you guys just stand up for a moment? And, uh, And so uh, we'll be awarding to the New Life Church uh, $47,000. It's the largest of our, of our grants. It's the first one we're giving, but we just want to help. We wanted to get it to them as soon as we could so that they could kind of begin to knock out the, uh, um, the remainder of the construction and get back to having a church building. And so, guys, we're so thrilled to be able to partner with you in the kingdom. Let's thank God for the New Life Assembly of God. <laughs> That's good night. So that still leaves about $50,000 in grants that we'll be awarding through the rest of the year. That'll be exciting. Um, some great ministries that our, our, uh, our grant team has, has chosen, and, and we look forward to being able to do that. And, and so let me just kind of wrap this up. Hey, so we're 20 months into a 24-month journey, this Elevate initiative, this journey of faith, uh, of kind of changing our heart priorities to more align with, with the things that God cares most about. And I, I just have, I've address a few different types of folks here. Some of you um, are on this journey, uh, and, and you're just kind of in the middle of it, and, and, you're, and you're still kind of giving towards your commitment, and, and I just want to encourage you. I mean, that's where, that's where Claire and I are. Claire and I will be giving towards our commitment until, like, December 31st, you know, and, uh, and, and so if that's where you're at, man, just kind of join in and, and, uh, and just continue to finish strong, and, and, and I just want to encourage you in that, that God's using your generosity in a big way. Some of you have, have, have let us know, hey, man, we, we, we fulfilled our commitment, and man, for you, we are grateful, and we just invite you, man, pray, and ask, maybe God's prompting you to even go an extra mile, and maybe give more than, than you were even originally imagining, and, and, and maybe some of you are newer to Life Church and haven't yet had chance to jump in on the elevator.
Elevate initiative. And, and so everything given uh, between now and December 31st is a part of this. It's a part of this whole thing, allowing us to make a big difference locally and globally, allowing us to, to make a big difference in the lives of, of kids health as far away as Bolivia, a church across town, launching our Midtown campus, blessing a ton of other ministries, and allowing our South campus to take next steps to reach more people here than ever before. And I just want to invite you, if you're not yet a part of this, to, to join in and help us finish strong. And, and uh, you know, maybe where someone else has moved away, some of some great people from Life Church that that were all in on this, moved away, moved out of state, and and, and may, maybe God's brought you here even to kind of partially or wholly fill in the gap. And so here's the biggest thing. I'm so, what's been incredible to me has been story after story after story of, of person that this journey of, of kind of wrestling with what really matters, what's going to last forever, caring more about forever stuff, less about temporary stuff, investing in a bigger way in the kingdom of God than we ever have before. It's been incredible just to hear stories of how God has used it in so many of your lives. And I'm so excited about the stories that are still going to be written over these coming months. Let me pray for us. So, Father, we love you. And God, I thank you for the people of Life Church. God, I thank you for all that you've done these last 12 and a half years. God, the families that are different because of how you've used people at Life Church, the individuals who, who have come to know you. God, the missionaries that we've been able to support around the world and locally. God, all the, all the things you've done. God, we just confess every good thing that's ever happened has been you. And God, we're just grateful that you invite us to be a part of what you're doing. And God, I thank you for, for inviting us even in this moment, this Elevate journey. And God, I thank you just for the incredible generosity. But God, from people that have little and from people that have a lot, recognizing it's not a matter of how, how much you've got, it's a matter of you having all of our hearts, you having all of us, us caring more about forever stuff, less about stuff that really doesn't matter. So God, we just give you these next few months, this next four months as we finish strong. God, I pray that you would empower us, Lord, to, 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 give, to give, but to give in a way that's just because we want to. God, to, that, that we would, would be cheerful givers, God. And that you would just do more things in us and through us than we can possibly imagine. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.